The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today, and we trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you. We're going to look at a topic that's very popular in the world about us, in the religious world, and it was also something that was very important in the ministry, in the mind of the Apostle Paul, and that is the issue of the power of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 11 when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the pleasure, uh, the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him. The work of faith with power. Um, it, The power of God working in the lives of people is something that was very important to the Apostle Paul. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, when the first epistle he wrote to them, he says in verse number 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. God's power working in people is something that's very important in the Scripture. Now, you hear a lot about that in, relig- in, 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 in uh, uh, religious uh, circles, uh, no matter what religion you're a part of, but especially in Christian religion. And people talk about the power of God. And, and, and yet, you know, you, I don't know if you've ever tried to define what the power of God is and, and uh, where is it, and where do I find God's power, and... Uh, when I find it, how do I get it into my life? Christianity is not a set of doctrinal uh, things to just agree to. It's more than that. I sat recently with a man, and he I'd, I've known this man for uh, many decades, actually. And he's a person who has no real interest in the Bible, no interest in, the, in, 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 in what he would call religion. And he was telling me how that he was a Christian. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, I've known you all these years and you've never given any indication of being a Christian. Why do you now say you're a Christian? And he says, well, I joined the church when I was, you know, I was Christian when I was a baby, baptized when I was a baby. And I'm, you know, and and I'm not a heathen. (laughs) And I said to him, you know, being a Christian isn't just a, a social status. It's not like going down and joining the Kiwanis Club or the Rotary or the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, a local ball team or something. Christianity is, it's not like, it's not something you get when you go join a church. Christianity is a, is a, is a relationship, a living relationship with a person who happens to be the creator of heaven and earth. It's not just a status that you, that, that you uh, attain unto. It's a living relationship. It's a personal relationship. It's something you have to take personally. That's why I say to you week after week as we study together, it's your faith, your personal reliance upon what God says that allows God's word and God's truth to work in your life for his glory. Because because salvation is a personal relationship with God. And we're going to talk about that, but I'm talking to you right now about the power of God. Where, is, where do you find God's power? And when you find it, how do you bring it into your life? Well, there's a verse of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, that you need to consider. When you have a question, uh, you know, Romans chapter 4, verse number 3 is the, is the verse you always should think about. What saith the Scriptures? <laughs> and that's the key. The question is always, what does God say? So people say, well, Brother Rick, what do you think about so-and-so? My stock answer is, what saith the Scriptures? When people ask me my opinion about various topics, economic stuff, political stuff, religious stuff, they say, what do you think about this or that or the next thing? My opinion about it is just just like anybody else, just an opinion. The key is, what does God say? 
Do you want to know what the Bible says about it? Now, if you want to know that, we've got something to talk about. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Notice that the word of God is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful. The reason that verse translates that word quick, uh, the word living, as quick is because God's word is alive and will work in your life. It doesn't take forever to get it done either. It will quickly make a difference in your life if you believe it. Why? Because it's the Word of God, and therefore it's powerful. Where is the power of God? God has taken His life and His power, and He's put it into a book called the Word of God. And that power is in His book so that you can access it. How do you get the Where do you find the power of God? It's in the Word of God. How do you get the power of God into your life? By believing the Word of God. Because as you receive God's Word into your life, as you, your faith rests upon an intelligent understanding of God's Word, that gives the Spirit of God the, 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 uh, uh, the, the ability to take the truth of God's Word and bring it into your experience and make it life for you. Now, when you, when you think about how God put His power in His Word... There are four terms that, that you need to think about. One is the term revelation. The first thing God did in order to put his word, his power, make it available to you by putting it into a, into a book. Come back with me to Isaiah chapter number 22. Is, is the, the, the issue of revelation. If God didn't speak and God didn't reveal his mind to you, you would never know who God was or what he had to say. So God has revealed his will. Isaiah chapter 22, I love this verse because of the way it says it. Isaiah 22 verse 14, and it was, Isaiah is talking now about his relationship with God. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts. Notice that Isaiah heard these words of God in his ears. You ever heard a preacher say, God spoke to me, but not in an audible voice. Well, preachers say that because, one, they want you to think God's talking directly to them, that they're special. But not in audible voices because people that go around hearing little voices in their head, you know, we tend to put them in those, those white coats that button up the back right before they put you in the little truck that's going to take you off to the booby hatch. When you hear voices, it's just, it's just not such. Isaiah said, I heard it with my ear. God revealed it to me. God made it known. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It isn't just that he spoke that way in time past. He spoke that way to the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter, we'll get 1 Corinthians 2 in one hand and Galatians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 2 and Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse number 11. Paul said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which preached of me is not after man, for neither, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, you know the message that I'm preaching? I didn't, it's not after man. It's not based on human viewpoint. I didn't receive it of man. It wasn't of human origin. Neither was I taught it. It wasn't here before me for so, so somebody could communicate it with, to me. Where do you get it then? By the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ stood face to face with Paul. You remember Moses says, uh, God tells uh, Israel back there in Numbers about Moses, I'm going to speak to him face to face. Paul says he, Jesus Christ spoke face to face and communicated this information to me. If you're going to know the power of God, first you're going to have to have God reveal himself to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9. As it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I hasn't seen, ear hadn't heard, it hadn't entered into your heart. That's the three ways you know everything you know. Your eye gate, your ear gate, and your heart. Your eye gate, empiricism, you see it. Your ear, you hear it. What is your ear? As the mouth trieth meat, so the ear t as the mouth, t mouth tasteth meat, Job says, so the ear tries words. 
First you see it, empiricism, the scientific method. Then, then you hear it, you hear words, you reason it out with words, you think it through. So you know some things because you can see it, feel it, touch it, empirical evidence. Some things don't, don't attest themselves that way. Some things you need to have logic and reason to think them through. And then the third way is the heart, where the heart man believes. The third way you know everything you know is faith. That's the three ways you know everything you can know in human experience. Your ear gate, your heart, your, your eye gate, and your heart gate. Empiricism, reasoning, and faith. And Paul says, actually he's quoting Isaiah, he says, by, every, by the way you know everything you know, you can't know what God has prepared for them that love him. But, now never read 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 without reading verse 10, because verse 10 says, but, while you with your ability, your ear gate, your eye gate, and your heart gate, can never know what God's prepared for them that love him, but, that's not the way it is all now, God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. You ever hear anybody say, well, we want to see what God's, God has prepared for us. Well, you, you, want to, you want to find what God's prepared for you today? Don't look around at your circumstances. Look in His Word because God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. Well, where did He do that? Verse 13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see, God the Holy Spirit has revealed the things that God has prepared for us in His Word. My point to you is the first thing you've got to understand when you want the power of God is that God put that power in His book, and the method whereby He put it in His book is first God reveals His mind. He reveals to you His thinking. He's revealed to us in words the things that He's prepared for us. Number two... Once you have revelation, then you have what the Bible calls the inspiration. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The greatest definition of inspiration ever given was not in a theology book or a theology class. It came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 3, when he's uh, actually, uh, not the Sermon on the Mount, but in his temptation uh, in the wilderness with, with, with the devil. Matthew chapter 3, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, he says, man should not live by bread alone, it's quoting Deuteronomy 8, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Inspiration is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, God revealed himself, but he did it with words that he has selected but when he selected those words, he caused those words to be written down. Isaiah, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. All scripture. Now look at that word scripture. See that word script in front of that? All the things that are written down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, and proof, correction, and instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God caused some, th some of these words that he's revealed to be written down. Come with me to Isaiah chapter number 30. Now, I just want you to, you know, you say, Brother Rick, you've got to think about this for a minute. This is a Bible study program, Okay. You need to think about what's happening here. First, God takes his power and puts it in a book. How does he do that? Well, first is revelation. Then is inspiration. He takes what he's revealed, his, what he's spoken, and he writes it down in a book. Isaiah 30, verse number 8. And now, he says, now go, listen, write it before them in a table and note it in a book. Take the words that I've, I've spoken and write them down in a book. Christianity, listen, Christians are people of a book. In fact, other religions of the world call Christians the people of the book. You know that? They're actually religious writings of other religions outside of Christendom that identify Christians as the people of the book. And they're exactly right about that. Because Christianity is based upon words that God wrote in a book. We are Bible people. 
And he says, go now, write it before them on a table, note it in a book. That's what scripture is. So you have revelation that's committed to the pages of the scripture by inspiration. And then he says, you're to do that, that it may be for a time to come forever and ever. So what have you got? One, God reveals his words, but he doesn't just leave them loose out there in the, in, in, in the, the, the nebula. He causes those words that he's revealed to be written in a book called Scripture. And he did that so that they might be preserved, that, that it may be for a time to come forever and ever. That's the doctrine of preservation. God didn't simply just write his word. He's caused that word to be preserved, and that's one of the reasons you write it in a book. You know, when you write a contract, it's written down. You don't have to remember it. If you wonder what's, what's going to happen, have you ever been to a real estate closing? I was at one just not too long ago. And there was a discussion about, well, should we do this or should we do that? And the, the, the attorney that was one of the attorneys said, he says, let's just go by what's in the contract. What a concept. Why? Something was written down. It was agreed on. Well, two months later, they got a little discussion about what, you know, what did we agree? Let's go back. It's written down. It's committed to writing. It's formal. It's there. It's fixed. And then God caused that book to be preserved through history. So that as over time, you and I could still have it and look at it. Come with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Matthew 22. Here's a verse of scripture that when I was a young believer, going through school back in my younger days, this is a verse of scripture that kept me from being a liberal and a modernist. It kept me, it made me be a Bible believer. Matthew 22. Now we're talking about, we're talking about revelation, then inspiration, and now what God has caused to be, what he, what he spoke, he caused to be written down. What he caused to be written down, he's preserved. Preservation is a missing element among Christians. The beginning of the last century when the great fundamentalist modernist debate came along, the conservative fundamentalist abandoned the doctrine of preservation that had been a part of the, of the historical view of the church for centuries before that. That God didn't just write it, he preserved it. Anytime you read a doctrinal statement that says that we, we believe the scripture in their original writings were thus and so, what they've done is they've abandoned. They said he, he, he revealed his word, he wrote it down, and it's gone. Well, what good is it if God wrote it down perfectly 2,000 years ago and you can't have it that way today? That's just an esoterical argument. It doesn't make any difference who wins or loses. That doesn't make any difference anyway. But the Bible teaches that God didn't just write it down, but that he's then, he wrote it down so that it could be preserved. Now, Jesus Christ in Matthew 22 is talking to the religious leaders of Israel, and he's going to talk to them about something Moses said. Moses wrote 1,500 years before the time of Christ. He wrote, wrote the book of Exodus when, uh, uh, when, when he brought Israel out of Egypt. Jesus quotes Exodus chapter number 3, and I want you to notice how he quotes it. He's not talking about original writings. He doesn't have a copy of the original book of Exodus. There's been 1,500 years of language change, of copying, of preserving God's Word through history. He's not talking about an original manuscript here. There aren't any original manuscripts available to them at this time. But now listen to what he says, Matthew twenty-two thirty-one. 31. And as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, underline it now, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, and then he quotes Exodus chapter number 3. Now Jesus Christ, while he was on the earth, picked up a copy of Exodus 3. It's a copy, it's not an original manuscript. It's a copy of the original manuscripts that was had 1,500 years before that. All the language changes, all of the, 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 the preservation and the, the, the keeping of it has he's taken place. And he says, what I'm reading right here is that which was spoken to you by God. Now, Matthew, 3, Matthew 4 identifies inspiration as that by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Inspiration is that which is spoken to you by God. 
1,500 years after God spoke the words that Moses recorded in Exodus 3, Jesus Christ quotes those words in Matthew 22 and says, this is what God spoke back there. We call that preservation. Go now, write it in a table, note it in a book, that it may be for the generations to come forever and ever. So there's revelation, then there's inspiration, then there's preservation. But that isn't all. There's also the issue of translation. In other words, when Jesus said that about the preserved word of God in Matthew 22, he was saying that this, this, this that you're reading right now in, in, in the first century in Matthew 22 is just as much the word of God as it was back there when Moses wrote it down originally. Because God's word has been preserved. But it also, in the scripture is God's word when it is translated into other languages. You see, you get, to, you get these people that believe that you got to have a college education, no Greek and Hebrew, to understand the Bible, because you got to go back to this original ancient language to read it. Now, they don't mean that. That's just what they tell you. To try to fool you into thinking you got to go to them to get God's word. There's not one in a hundred of those people that tell you that, that does what they say they do. They don't read the Greek and Hebrew. And if they do, they read it at about a second or third grade level, and who would want them, a second or third grader to tell them what God said? But beside that, think about it. They don't, tell, they, don't, they don't make you sit down and talk Greek or Hebrew. They translate it for you. That's what I just said. They want you to come to them so they can tell you what God's Word said. And then they translate it. And the necessity of translating it into the languages of the nations is a natural thing. Now, in the Scripture... The Word of God is still the Word of God even after it's translated. Look with me back at Matthew, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 22. And I want you to remember and think about what we're doing here. Every point I'm giving you, I'm trying to illustrate it and show you from a verse in the Bible why I say this. I'm not trying to teach theology to you. I'm not trying to teach a theological system to you. I'm just trying to talk to you about what the Bible tells you about revelation, inspiration, preservation, and translation. And when it talks about uh, revelation, it says God made himself known. Otherwise, you'd never know his thoughts. When it talks about inspiration, it says God takes what he's revealed and put it down on a piece of paper so you can read it. And it can be preserved through history so you've got preservation. God preserves his word through history in an identifiable, accessible form. And then he has it causes it to be translated. And when it's translated into your language, it is just as authoritative and, mu- and as much the Word of God as it was in the original language. How do I know that? Acts chapter number t- 22. Paul is standing on the porch of Jerusalem. Verse 1, it says, Men and brethren, fathers, hear ye that my defense, which I make unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue... To them, they kept the more silence. And he said, and then he talks to them in the Hebrew language. And he talks to them in the Hebrew language down to verse number 21. So from verse 1 to 21 in this passage, he was speaking in the Hebrew language. But when Luke wrote that down, what language did he record it in? He recorded it in Greek. There's never been a, a manuscript of the book of Acts found with Acts 22 in Hebrew. Think about that. Because so you can't have an inspired translation. Well, there's one. God, the Holy Spirit, when he wrote Acts 22 in, 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 through the hand of, of Luke, took what Paul said in Hebrew, translated it into Greek. <laughs> but that's not unusual. It's done in the Bible all the time. When Moses went into Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, let my people go. You think he talked to Mr. Big in Hebrew or in Egyptian? I mean, just think about it. You know he talked in Egyptian. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's daughter's home. He knew Egyptian. But you know what he wrote it in the book of Exodus? You know what language he wrote it in? He wrote it in Hebrew. God the Holy Spirit translated it and was satisfied with the translation to the extent that he would such a part of my inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. You see, if you have an accurate translation of the proper Hebrew and Greek text, you have in your language... God's Word, just as authoritative and real as it was in the original language. 
You want the power of God? God put it in His Word. Revelation, inspiration, preservation, translation. And if you've got a King James Bible, you've got the Word of God in your language just as authoritatively as you would in any, even in the original language. And you've got it in a form you can read it. Now, how do you get that power out of that book into your life? Well, Paul tells you in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that it's the Word of God that works effectually in you that, that's right, believe. You see, it's your faith resting on an intelligent understanding of what God says to you in His Word that allows the Holy Spirit to take the truth of what He's revealed in His Word and bring it into your experience and make it the energizing, powerful Word of God and life in you. That's why I talk to you constantly about rightly dividing the Word of truth because it's your understanding of God's Word to you. Not trying to be Israel, not trying to be somebody God didn't make you, but being who you are as a member of the church, the body of Christ, that allows the Spirit of God... To take the truth of, uh, of God's grace and bring it into the details of your life and release that power of the life of Jesus Christ in your life. So it's your faith resting on the truth of, uh, on your understanding of God's word, rightly divided, that gives the Holy Spirit that liberty and makes God's word the power in your life. God's put his power in his word and he releases that power in your life as your faith rests on an intelligent understanding of God's word. Takes God's word and says that's truth. Circumstances and all the rest are not. This is reality and rest by faith in it. Well, they tell me it's time to go. So we'll go. See you next time. Till then, Maranatha. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have an audio CD we would like you to have to go along with today's study. It's yours free of charge. It's our way of saying thank you for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal. If you simply write us here at The Message of Grace, the address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you may also call us at regular business hours, toll-free, 888-535-2300. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If our study together has been a help to you, we would be happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. He took the blame. And then I cried